So hello everybody, my name is Kaleb and um, I'm the GNOME software guy here. So uh, like uh, David said, um, uh, we were both at uh, Flock uh, last week uh, with Richard and, uh, and, uh, and we decided that Richard gives a GNOME software talk at Flock and I'm going to do the same here. So uh, I have a slight problem, I, I am not sure how to uh, go to the next slide here. <laughs> Uh, so, hold on, maybe I'll... Uh... It's pinpoint, right, if anyone yeah, knows. But... <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, right? Okay, that's a little bit more promising. Okay, maybe this works better. Yeah, now it works. Okay. <laughs> So um, uh, I have no idea what's uh, what's wrong with me, but I always manage to get like the most horrible cold uh, during Quadex. Last year at uh, Gothenburg, I was I was like almost uh, completely out during Quadex, and and like only managed to to like come uh, come during daytime uh, with like full of pills. And apparently, I'm having a bit of the same problem here today. So, uh, so if you guys see uh, that I'm like um, uh, starting to ramp randomly, or or uh, or like um, uh, yeah, so so just uh, let me know that I'm uh, off topic then. <laughs> yeah, so um, so uh, all of GNOME software uh, started uh, actually years ago uh, in uh, when uh, Richard Hughes started uh, Package Kit. And uh, that was uh, that was basically because uh, because uh, he had his wife, who uh, who had a Windows laptop, and uh, and he he wanted his uh, his wife to be able to use the computer, but he got this she got this all the time, so so she so Richard was like yeah I have to do something about this, and then decided that uh, and she and he made a deal with his wife that. Uh, if she installs Linux, then uh, then Richard will uh, commit to fixing all his problems, and and of course there was the dependency hell and all of this. So this is how Package Kit started, and with all this crazy architecture and stuff. And yeah, I'm not gonna go into this. It's too crazy. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, and Package Kit was basically uh, was uh, was basically an abstraction over uh, over distribution packages. So so there was RPM and there was Debian's packages and there was you know other stuff. <laughs> yeah, and on top of this was was Package Kit with with its uh, very nice abstracted architecture. And uh, and one thing that was a very strong point in Package Kit was that it was really 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 nice in architecture wise. Like things made sense there. Like there were separate backends, and then there was a thing on top of that, and and then a separate UI that talked to the Dbus, and it was very very nice architecture wise. But uh, that actually didn't uh, make uh, such a very uh, very nice uh, UI because uh, the Package Kit front end that we had. The GNOME package kit. It was basically just exposing the the really nice architecture we had, the low level architecture, just exposing all of that to the user, and the, and it it ended up quite confusing. So it was basically just having the same thing, just the same thing that uh, that it just tried to fix. It was just showing it, uh, showing it, and uh, and not actually fixing any problems. Yeah. So we have some more nice package kit screenshots. Yeah. Yeah, and an error message here. Yeah, so uh, so uh, and in uh, I think it was 2012. It was when uh, Jakob Steiner and uh, John McCann and uh, Alan Day decided to to uh, start uh, designing an application installer from ground up, like uh, not 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 relying on on what was possible but re but just designing the UI so that it would would uh, would be nice and usable and that so that it actually made sense and uh, so this started uh, so this is one of the the mockups uh, one of the most recent mockups that just tries to be beautiful and usable and um, yeah, and and so compared to uh, to package kit world where the code like make made really very nice sense architecture wide, GNOME software is much much more messy actually. 
this, uh, since uh, GNOME software doesn't try to be so nice architecture way, it does, it does try to be really nice uh, UI-wise. So uh, this, this actually makes a much messier code, but, uh, but that's okay, I think. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a small price to pay if we can uh, have uh, happy users. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is where we, what we have now. And uh, this is uh, this is latest uh, GNOME software uh, as of uh, a few days ago. So this is the first landing page, and it has a nice uh, nice big banners on top where uh, that show our best available software and and uh, categories that you can browse and and search for stuff. And so. Uh, one one of the the main uh, main things that uh, that made uh, GNOME software different from package kit was that um, was that it didn't try to do everything anymore. Package kit was uh, was basically just try to try to show everything that was available in the distro, and that was very very messy. But GNOME software. Uh, did not try to do that anymore. Instead, it it it, uh, it tried to be an application installer. So uh, and. That means that applications are first-class citizens there, and and every every app or anything you click on has nice screenshots and nice descriptions and everything. And uh, this makes a much much nicer user interface. So uh, how did we uh, how did we make this possible? So uh, behind the scenes. Uh, Every every app, every graphical app that is uh, shown in GNOME software is uh, uh, uses, uh, called app data, and this is a, an example sm small app data file. And uh, and uh, for an app to show up in GNOME software, each app needs to have this uh, this uh, extra description on top of uh, distro metadata. So. So, for example, this is the this is the app data description for GNOME software itself. It uh, it has uh, it has an ID that matches up with uh, with uh, with the app itself, and then it uh, has uh, descriptions and uh, screenshots, and uh, and uh, this is basically what we show up to the user. And um, um, uh, when the uh, when uh, when uh, Alan and uh, John and uh, and uh, Jakob uh, started uh, designing GNOME software, uh, I think it was the same year when uh, when uh, Matthias Klump and uh, and uh, Richard Hughes started the App Data project. And uh, and at first it, it wasn't really actually used much, and it was uh, going really really slow. But uh, but uh, but when the first GNOME software prototype got into Fedora, that that su suddenly caused like a huge huge uptake in the app data because uh, because this is what was needed for apps to show up nicely in GNOME software. And uh, and uh, and since uh, GNOME software at first was pretty much a Fedora centric thing. It was the Fedora App Center first, and uh, and other distros uh, started uh, picking it up a little bit later. It meant that uh, Fedora was basically driving all the uh, app data effort. So uh, at first we had like a separate add-on repository where we where we like glued these app data files on top of existing packages, and then a while later we uh, we moved those app data stuff into actual packages and then and then maintainers started upstreaming them and and uh, and uh, and and uh, today i think most of uh, like almost all of gnome i only know like two packages that don't have updated there and the most of kd and uh part of xfc and and lots and lots of other upstream projects have a uh, have uh, updated files and uh, uh, and it has uh, gotten a really, really nice uptake. And uh, and uh, these uh, these days, it's not just uh, GNOME software that's consuming this. It's also um, the KD App Center Muon, or I have no idea how to pronounce it, but yes, that thing, yes. And uh, and also Snap is uh, or Snap is starting to uh, uh, switch uh, to update. Uh, so this is. 
this is pretty much the the future of uh, app metadata in Linux desktop. So we have Matthias uh, Klump uh, sitting there. So if you have any uh, yes or uh, comments about uh, the metadata itself, like how to improve this, uh, he's the guy to talk to. So um, I'm not sure how well it is visible here in the graph. It's a little bit gray, but yeah. So uh, anyway, so uh, starting with uh, with uh, last GNOME release 3.20, GNOME software also has uh, has ratings and uh, and uh, support and. Uh, this is this is actually so up until uh, that release, GNOME software was pretty much given by by uh, by the Fedora people. It was uh, Richard working on this and me working on this and a bunch of uh, other people sometimes contributing. But in uh, 3.20, uh, in the spring we had um, we had we had a hackfest uh, in London, and we had endless people there. We had canonical people there. We had Red Hat people there, and uh, and and we actually had all those like competing groups working really and really nicely together all on the ground and so uh, and one of the and uh, I guess Ubuntu users here know that that Ubuntu now also switched to GNOME software in their latest release and uh, one of the things. They wanted from Gnome's author was to able to show rating and user reviews, so so they pushed for a UI for this that got uh, integrated in Gnome's author, and uh, and uh, Richard wrote the backend uh, for uh, for a review server, which is called ODRS. So so the thing is that Ubuntu has their own review server and ODRS is basically for like the rest of the distro ecosystem that uh, that doesn't have Ubuntu accounts and stuff so so uh, and and so and so far uh, ODRS uh, has been shipping in uh, in Fedora and Arch I think and and it has had some very very nice uh, use so the the gray a graph here shows the number of users on on this, and we have we are reaching like uh, half a million users there, and uh, it has had very very nice uptake. So uh, how does it all work? So uh, much different to uh, Ubuntu's review server, ODRS is uh, is open and open in the sense that everybody can uh, can send their reviews. They don't need to have an actual account, and. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, me too. Like uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people here are thinking right now, what? How is it possible that uh, to have no authentication or anything like this? And uh, I have to confess that uh, that uh, when Richard was uh, was uh, uh, came up with the idea, I, I too was uh, was very skeptical about this and uh, and tried to convince him to uh, to uh, do something different. But he he was uh, he's stubborn. Way so he he went ahead and and it seems to be working actually very well in practice so so uh, so um, uh, every user who posts uh, the reviews there um, uh, GNOME software uh, looks up their machine ID and hashes it and that's basically the uh, the user ID in there and uh, and that makes it possible to like ban uh, uh, bad users and also uh, at when there's uh, when we have a review, uh, there's, there are buttons under every review where you can say that uh, was this review review useful to you, or if you or if there was something like bad in this, like someone is using bad words or it's just spam, then it's possible to report this. And uh, and and uh, and so far all this uh, this has worked remarkably well there have been very few few people like abusing this and the few abusers uh, they have been caught in like uh, pretty much uh, in a few hours after posting uh, something uh, bad and blocked immediately and uh, yeah it's working uh, great so far so these are just some examples how uh, how the reviews work here So um, starting in this cycle, 
GNOME software has a public uh, a plugin API. So um, GNOME software architecture is uh, is very uh, is very plugin based. So um, which makes it very very easy to uh, to add uh, different kinds of backends. GNOME software started uh, started largely as a as a Fedora app uh, center, yeah, basically being able to. Uh, but over the years, it has gotten lots and lots of different uh, new backends. So uh, these days, it's able to to uh, to install uh, uh, through uh, through package kit, and uh, and it has a separate Ubuntu backend that does not go through uh, through a package kit. And then it has uh, has a flat back backend and OS3 backend, and uh, and. Um, Matthias, uh, what was the what was the thing that you worked on that uh, you had the plugin for? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and the code for different backends is actually surprisingly simple to write. It's it's, uh, it's all abstract. So uh, three twenty two, we decided to to make the plugin API uh, uh, plugin API uh, public in the sense that uh, uh, to make it possible to have out of three plugins. And uh, so one idea for this was basically for enterprise cost customers to, to if they need something specific from GNOME software, to be able to like customize this. So so they wouldn't need to have their own build of GNOME software, but we could just ship an one extra plugin for that those specific customers. So in uh, three twenty two we have a public uh, plugin API and uh, and we have a. Uh, generating documentation for the API, so uh, and uh, and Richard wrote a series of uh, blog posts for this. So um, if anyone uh, is working on uh, on uh, on a distro level on GNOME software and wants to wants to add uh, their own plugins, uh, try to catch me afterwards and we can discuss this. Yeah, so uh, so like I said, we we had a hackfest in London in the spring, and uh, and and it really worked well. We had a nice cooperation between uh, different uh, distro people, and and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, even though at first it seemed to be like a very Fedora centric project, it has to, a, lo a lot and lot. Distros have started using it. We have uh, Debian using it. We have OpenSUSE using it. We have Ubuntu using it, and Fedora, of course. And and uh, we are shipping it in RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And so uh, it seems that GNOME Software is basically uh, becoming the de facto uh, app center for uh, the Linux desktop. So uh, some more new features we have in uh, GNOME Software. Uh, one thing we did for uh, Fedora 24 is to uh, is to make it possible to to system upgrades. So uh, this is one of the things that um, I must say that uh, uh, we we've, we've been missing in Fedora for a long, long while, and it, it was a and uh, and some some other uh, some other distros uh, have 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 had uh, graphical system upgrade support for a while and and uh, we were sadly missing it. So, but instead of doing it uh, in like a very Fedora specific way, we uh, we uh, we did it in GNOME software so that uh, so that pretty much all distros could uh, could use the same code if they wanted to. And this is this is how it uh, how it looks uh, like in Fedora. So. Um, uh, so a Fedora 23 user gets a pop-up saying that uh, saying that a new uh, a new Fedora version is available. They click on the pop-up and then click on a button to download all the upgrades, which all happens uh, happens in the background. And then when it's ready, they click install. The machine reboots and uh, and all the packages are installed uh, during the reboot, and then they just boot into their new. Uh, New fresh uh, Fedora 24 system, and um, th this is this is quite similar to uh, to regular system updates we have in uh, software. 
but we we spent uh, spent a lot and lot time polishing this uh, new feature for Fedora. We had Fedora QA testing it for. Uh, uh, we we tried to we iterated it over it uh, uh, several times so we had fedora qa testing it and uh, and they reported a bunch of bugs so and uh, and uh, i think this is a, this is very very nice and stable now so uh, if you do get this uh, this uh, pop up on fedora 23 just click on it and and you'll be in fedora 24 and uh, and hopefully you'll still have a working system <laughs> Yep, so this is a picture of the future. So, um, so yeah, no, no, this is not the future we are going to have, hopefully. Uh, but uh, but instead, uh, the future we are uh, aiming for is is where we have, um, is where we have a split of a base OS and applications, so that we have uh, have the base OS on an OS tree level. Uh, updatable separately, and then on top of this, on a separate layer, we have uh, flatback uh, applications. And uh, this is pretty much what uh, what Android, for example, has been doing, or Windows, or Mac OS. And uh, I personally, personally, I am personally very, very excited to be getting uh, closer to that uh, future. So uh, Alex already uh, gave a nice overview in his uh, previous talk about flatback and uh, on sunday there will be an uh, a talk by owen uh, for how the test of future is uh, going to look in his vision so uh, but but just just in a few words so so the idea is that we have a base os fedora for example which is like a small core and uh, that's that's all based in os3 and uh, OS3, uh, like compared to uh, to a package centric model that where we are right now, OS3, OS3 is um, OS3 uh, treats the whole base system as one single uh, entity, so that uh, instead of upgrading updating packages one by one and then having a, a huge test matrix where you have to test one package version together with uh, with another package version and then a third package comes into the mix and then there's like a huge explosion of the testing matrix uh, with with OS3 uh, the idea is that the uh, whole system is composed on a server level and the user just downloads downloads that exact copy on their machine and uh, and uh, and and get get this uh, get the, the exact same tested system, tested uh, um, mix that uh, developers have uh, have been doing, and uh, and OS3 also makes it possible to do um, atomic updates, so that uh, the user downloads an update, reboots, and then is immediately booted into the re uh, new system, uh, and uh, and it also makes it possible to have atomic uh, downgrades as well. Because because we can keep uh, keep the previous base system around as well. We can have two, three, a number of versions of the previous uh, version uh, available, and and we can have a UI that uh, that uh, where the user can just put into a previous version if there's a problem with the new one. So this is this is one of the the things that uh, we'll be aiming for uh, for the next cycle. I will be uh, working on the on making the OS three thing in uh, GNOME software work well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually not sure exactly what's on the screenshot here. Richard uh, prepared it. I, I think it's it's uh, Ubuntu Snappy support when GNOME software is running on Ubuntu, and uh, it's uh, it's doing something. Yeah, it's coming along. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, and and we have a. Uh, uh, we have a uh, we have flatback support in GNOME software. So uh, one thing that makes uh, flatback uh, a little bit difficult to use is that, from GNOME software point of view, is that uh, we can have uh, the same app available as a flatback and also as a distro package. 
And uh, this can be a bit confusing and, uh, and difficult for the user. So, so what we did was, uh, was to... So this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this screenshot there uh, is, uh, is when a user searches for Polari and gets uh, two results. And uh, I'm not sure how well it's visible on the uh, screen here, but um, uh, the, the uh, higher result, this is the distro version, and the lower result is from the uh, flat pack. And, uh, and we try to differentiate it uh, by uh, having a sandbox shield under the Flatback app. And also, that we, and also there's a um, gray line that says source under each app. So one of them says that the source is a Fedora project, and the other one is from GNOME. So uh, hopefully this will um, make it easier for the users to, um, to know where the app is coming from. Yeah, and some more flatback screenshots. So this is actually, if you search for flatback, then you get uh, get all the flatback apps that uh, GNOME software knows about. So um, since we uh, since we are moving in in a world of uh, to a world of uh, flatback, um, we are also uh, moving uh, away from a like a centralized distro system where where we where we where we could be sure that all the apps that we use are free software so um, so and to educate the users a little bit we uh, we try to show in Chrome software if uh, if an app is free or if it's proprietary software or if it's uh, something in between so um, so free so free uh, apps in uh, in GNOME software are uh, in the next version are going to get a a label that says free, and when when you click on this, then you get all the license details, like if it's GPL or BSD license or uh, MIT. And uh, proprietary apps instead get a get a different uh, label that says proprietary, and uh, and clicking on that um, shows the proprietary license details. So um, this is a little bit of a workaround because um, because uh, because up until now we've been doing the actual license information, but this this uh, this this seems like an okay idea until we we run into a monster like uh, like LibreOffice for example. So uh, I'm not kidding. LibreOffice has a license string that is that wide, and in a font like this, so it's like. A long, 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 long text. It's like all possible free licenses are included there. It's like GPL2 and LGPL and LGPL3 and uh, BSD and MIT and uh, the Mozilla public license and so on and so on and so on. So we, we were just unable to show it uh, in the UI because it would just take up the half of the page there. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so what we so we did this instead now. So um, one thing that uh, Alex uh, mentioned in his talk, uh, in his previous talk, was that uh, it would be really nice to uh, have a, an easy way to build flatbacks, to have a to have a service for this. And uh, so this is something that I am personally not, uh, I haven't been involved in, but this is something that Richard did, and uh, and I was editing the screenshots here and and uh, and uh, editing my uh, talk during uh, Alex's uh, talk, and uh, and I, I put this uh, here just to like show that that Richard is working on a prototype, which makes it very very easy to build flatbacks, so you just just basically uh, give it the JSON file, and it uh, and it builds flatbacks for you. So uh, I'm not sure if it's publicly available yet, but uh, this is something to look forward to. So uh, if anyone wants to work on this, uh, sadly Richard isn't here, but, uh, but grab him on IRC and... Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so the thing I, I, uh, I, uh, I was talking before, that uh, we can have uh, two apps, or mo even more, like one from the distro and one from Flatback. So, um, what to, what to do if we um, if a user tries to install install something uh, from Flatback that they already have installed as a distro package? So this is um, this is one one idea that Alan came up with. 
is to uh, is to have this kind of dialogue where where we have the distro package and the flatback package, and and then the user gets to choose uh, whether to do parallel install or whether to replace the app. So uh, so this is so far this is pretty much just uh, just discussion. But uh, if anyone has a better idea how to solve this problem, uh, grab Alan and uh, and discuss this with him, and uh, and grab me too, so I can be uh, there. So. So, that's it. Questions? Uh, yeah. So the question uh, was uh, if it's possible to uh, to download um, the review and. Uh, the software review information from the server. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, I don't think it's uh, it's currently not available as a like a nicely packaged download, like a tarpor or anything. But there's a uh, there's a there's an uh, there's a there's an API where you can uh, like pro pro programmatically ask for this and get the JSON file in response. So. So uh, if you want to, yeah, definitely, it's all open and uh, it's possible to get it. That's a I'll be quick. Uh, as far as backends and other types of software, um, what are your thoughts on supporting something like PIP or other uh, language-specific uh, so, so uh, system? So uh, GNOME software, so the question was, uh, what are my thoughts on uh, on adding a backend to use uh, pip or something uh, or some other uh, language specific um, repository so um, um, so right now uh, software is uh, is very very application centric and applications in gnome software uh, uh, point of view are uh, are very are only graphical applications. It's something that that you can click in GNOME Shell that has a launcher, and that this is an application in GNOME software. And uh, and because of that, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have like a pip backend because pip is pr pretty much used for for dis for distributing only uh, only Python. Uh, much as applications, so so uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but but it would certainly be very very easy to add a backend such as this. It's uh, uh, it shouldn't be a lot. Um, so I have a question. Uh, one of the things I've really been interested about uh, with GNOME software and just an app store in general is building a relationship between. Uh, the developer and the user, right? And one of the things we, we have in our distro focus model is the, the distro is the middleman between the user and the developer. So the user never sees the developer generally. Like, so, um, and so we have an opportunity to, to build that relationship using something like GNOME software. So what I would like to see, um, it's more of a request, is some way for a developer to reach out to the users. I mean, for feedback or uh, maybe even the opportunity to, uh, as Alex was alluding to in his talk, uh, paying for software. Um, do you have you thought in in that direction, you and Richard? So so um, so uh, this is exactly one of the things that. Flatback is trying to uh, solve because uh, right now the distro landscape is very very fragmented. We have a huge amount of distros, all shipping like a little bit modified versions of the same app, and the developer has basically no control over it. So uh, so uh, what we are hoping for is is to have uh, is to have developers packaging their own stuff as Flatback and uh, and. The, the distro moving a little bit uh, away from uh, uh, from the um, app distribution, so so the distros would would uh, would be like more focused on the core, and uh, developers would be uh, shipping their own applications, and uh, and yeah, of course of course we will need uh, definitely we will need at least a way to uh, report bugs, so uh, so a very easy thing we could do is to is to just uh, add a link to uh, upstream Bugzilla like. Uh, uh, so if uh, flatback metadata has a boxilla link 
then we or park track a link, then we just show it up in the in GNOME software or something like that. This would be very very easy to do, and uh, and yeah, of course uh, paid apps would be would be nice to do as well. But it's a little bit uh, more difficult problem, but uh, but we would like to solve this as well somehow. Yeah. Expanding a bit on, on that idea, I would I would really like to see a really easy way from GNOME software to get into the development. You know, and we have in Flatback we have the SDKs. We have really good ways to say, oh, I want to code on this. I want to get the source code, and I want good SDK. Do we have design to to make that work? Is that on the roadmap? No, I I, I don't think I don't think we've uh, we've uh, even thought of this. Uh, but uh, but maybe we could sit down with Alan uh, later and. Talk about this. I don't know. So um, I also would like to just expand on those because um, the upstream specification has support <clears throat> for um, for a donation URL type, and since. I think three days ago, uh, support for a translation uh, or translate a URL type, which means that software centers like GNOME software could show uh, a link, donate to the software here, or help translating the software into your language uh, if you click on this button. Uh, for some reasons, the GNOME designers didn't like the donate button thing, so I'm not sure why this isn't added. But uh, yeah, I think Richard will push for getting the translate button there, which is uh, one reason, one easy way to get into developing the software and to help translating it into a different language directly from the GNOME software UI. So, no question, but just <laughs> expanding on that. Yeah, so, so the person speaking was uh, Matthias Klump, who's the uh, uh, App data specification maintainer upstream, and uh, and he he he's, he's the person to to talk to to get like uh, to get uh, donation links and stuff into the metadata specification. So um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, I have uh, Fedora installed on my parents' computers. And they are also have, a, have some uh, external repositories like Oracle's VirtualBox repository. And Oracle is changing fingerprints for this repository uh, as other people change their trousers. So, and immediately uh, after DNF, you have to uh, accept the new fingerprint and they are not using the console commands. Immediately then, everything starts to break. They can no longer do any updates and they can no longer install any software via the, uh, the GNOME software uh, application. Uh, is there any plans to add maybe some visual debugger or have uh, dialogues to uh, just, well, press yes? Yeah, so... Um yeah, so uh, this is a bug we need to fix. I don't think I need to comment anymore. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, listening to me and uh, see you at the conference. Thank you. <laughs>